I love it. Welcome to Worms. This is so exciting. So we are moving through the phyla of animal groups. We've done two very, very simple animal groups, peripherans and cnidarians. Now we're moving into more complicated animals. Um, and there's actually not a phylum of worms. There's actually four, maybe five phylums of worms. Uh, but we're going to deal with them all as one group. Um, and so we're going to talk about worms today. And then tomorrow we're going to do a microscopy lab where you will look at a pair of slides of worms. And then on Monday we get to uh, cut them open. It's going to be beautiful. Worms are actually really cool by section. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're talking about worms today. So multiple phyla uh, represented in this group, and we'll deal with uh, a couple of them specifically, and a couple of them we're not going to lecture on because they're, they're, you, know, you, can't do, you can't do everything. So, but we're going to talk about several groups here today. So generally speaking, oh, my picture covers up my funny little, here we go. <laughs> Hi, Wormy. Okay. Um, so, worms are animals from several phyla that share various characteristics. So, one of them is that they're cephalized. Cephalus is the, or uh, yeah, cephalos is the word in Greek for a head. So, being cephalized means they have a head. Uh, sponges are acephalic. Cnidarians are acephalic. They are not cephalized. They do not have a head. You can't punch a, a, uh, a, 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 a jellyfish. You can't punch a jellyfish in the head. There is no such thing, right? But a worm has a head. So they're the first of the groups that we've talked about that have one. And uh, a head is usually the part of the critter that goes first into the world, right? Um, and is usually where the sense organs are, and is sometimes, most of the times, where the mouth is. Although one of the animal groups we're going to look at today does not have its mouth on its head. It has a head, but the mouth is not there. Um, so for, for most critters, it's where the sense organs and the mouth is located, and it tends to be the first thing that it, it moves head first in the world. We stand upright, so we move, you know, belly button first. But the uh, but the head is is always it's still facing forward. Uh, some critters don't move head first into the world, and that gets a little strange. You know, squid they they travel hiney first, uh, and that's kind of weird. But uh, most organisms head first, sense organs mouth. These are long, soft, legless bodies, but some do have appendages. Um, so it's kind of confusing. What do you mean legless, but some have appendages? You'll see in a little bit. Some of their bodies have bumps, uh, and the bumps on the segments do help them, like, crawl around with things. But it's not a leg. They can't move it independent of the body. It's just this nub that sticks out on the side that they use to kind of anchor themselves into their world. Okay, so uh, these are long, soft, legless bodies, and they have three cell layers. A, uh, a sponge had really two cell layers. It had an, an epidermis, and then it had the, uh, the collar cells lining the cavities. A, uh, a cnidarian definitely has two layers, the epidermis and the gastrodermis. Now we have three cell layers. And this is a tube within a tube that has filling, is kind of the way to think about this. And you'll see this in the microscopy tomorrow. When you slice a worm transversely, you will see a ring of tissue um, that is the epidermis and the musculature, the body wall. And then inside, you'll see another ring of tissue, which is the gut, right, the digestive tract. And then in between the gut and the body wall is stuff, organs. So it's a layer, it's a, it's a tube and a tube that has filling around the, the in between, right? Uh, loop, a lupia. What's a lupia? Yeah, it's like fried banana. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, but the banana would need to have some kind of like noodle right through the middle of it. Make that wise. A shish kebab lumpia. There you go. That works. That works. Um, so we named these the epidermis, the skin on the outside. Uh, epi means upon or around. Okay. And so this is the, the derm, the tissue layer, the skin that's upon or around the creature on the outside. Um, the epidermis meso means in between, means middle. So mesoderm is the middle tissue. That's all the organs. And then the endoderm, which is on the next slide, I think, unless my text fell off the bottom. I think my text fell off the bottom. The number three will be endoderm, E-N-D-O, derm. And endo means inside. So endoderm is the, the gastrovascular, it's not the vascular, the gastrointestinal tract. The, the gut. Okay? The, the gastrointestinal tract, or usually the gut, the intestines, the stomach and intestines. Um, you are also three layers, right? If I were to take you and slice you transversely, which would be a bad day, um, you would find that you have a layer of body wall and skin and musculature around the outside. Now, your gastrointestinal tract is much longer than you are, so it's coiled up and wound up and in your tummy. But it's still a tube inside a tube, right? It's just that the inner tube is all wound up. And then we have, you have stuff in between your gastrointestinal tract and your body wall. You've got hearts and lungs and lips and spleens and kidneys and all that stuff too. So you are the same basic body plan. You are also a tube within a tube with some filling. Okay, um, and we use the same terms for you. Epidermis, your skin, right? Um, mesoderm is something that you will use, again, when we talk about embryos of more complicated animals like yourself. Um, mesoderm um, is, a, is a layer of tissue in the embryo, and then the gastroderm, we use that same word as well. I'm sorry, the endoderm, we use that same word again. So these three cell layers are with us for the rest of the animal groups. The worms are the, the simplest creatures, to demonstrate the three layers of tissue, uh, but you will see the three layers of tissue as we move forward. So here is an example of a worm. Worms are cool. This happens to be a segmented worm. Uh, you can see the body divided into segments, and it has these little bumps sticking out on the side. These are not legs. It cannot go like this, right? There's no muscles and rigid, uh, jointed appendages. That's not what we're talking about. That would make the millipede, right? It would go like this. But um, these are just like bumps and hairs that stick out of the side of the body. And as it crawls around, those bumps and hairs like anchor it into the ground so it can move along faster, better. Um, so that's a that's a polychaete worm. And you'll see that group in a little bit here. This is another worm, and I wish I didn't have a speckled projector. Uh, this is a beautiful creature. This is a uh, this is also a polychaete worm, but it's a it's a marine species, and it is filter feeding with gills. So it sticks its gills out, and the gills come out of its mouth, which is kind of weird. It opens its mouth, and out come its gills. It would be like you coughing up your lungs, right? But this is designed to happen that way. Okay, opens its mouth, and out come its gills. And then it respires, right, because the gills are out of the water, and it can breathe, and that's great. And then when a food particle gets stuck to its gills, the gills are kind of sticky, then it draws its gills back in, and it, like, cleans the food particles off as they go back in, and it eats the food that got stuck to the gills. It's pretty cool. It's an awesome design. Um, and some of these gills are just gorgeous. And so it's kind of like flowers. God doesn't have to make it pretty. He could have just made them red because they're full of blood. Um, but he made them beautiful so that when you're snorkeling and scuba diving and swimming, you can look down and see these feather duster worms and be like, wow, praise Jesus for you. You're beautiful. Um, and so there's more examples of feather duster worms. Isn't that gorgeous? And those are just gills. He's breathing and eating. But it's beautiful. That's a, that's a worm's gills, yep. 
No, if you touch them, they'll go, they get sucked back in real quick. Um, it would look very much like this, you know, because it's the same kind of word, it's the same worm family, but he's just displaying his, his gills. This is also a worm, this is a flat worm, um, and the flat worms are also beautiful creatures that uh, when, you're, when you see them out on the reefs, um, they look gorgeous. This is, uh, this is a, a, a critter called a nudibranch. Uh, they're beautiful, flatworms. This is a flatworm swimming. They're, no, yeah, this is a flatworm swimming. So he can undulate his body's his body like a like a stingray or something like that and swim through the water. These are two worms. My wife did her um, her senior research thesis on these creatures, um, and so. They, they secrete a little shell of sorts to live in, and these red things are their gills. They're two worms with their gills sticking out, breathing and eating, and they filter bacteria out of the water and eat it, and they live down in the deepest parts of the ocean next to volcanic vents um, in communities called black smokers, where, where um, volcanic heated water is coming out of cracks in the Earth's crust. And the, uh, the light is not centered around sunlight, it's centered around hot chemical water um, that derive, that's where the, the bacteria derive their chemical energy from. And then these guys eat the bacteria that are doing chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis. It's really cool. But these are worms. Uh, so first phylum we're going to look at is platyhelminthes, flat worms flat like a plate um, and that's why a plate is called a plate it's derived from the word plati which means flat okay so a flat thing to eat off of is a plate and a flat worm is a plata helminth helminth is the word that means worm so a plate worm a flat worm okay the vast majority of these creatures are parasites so um, I just showed you a couple of pictures of flatworms that were not parasites and they're swimming free in the ocean. But most of the time, flatworms are parasites. So most of the time, you don't want them to be your friend uh, because they would like to live inside you when you're sick. Um, the, the largest group of these flatworms live in a, are a, a group of worms called flukes. And fluke, you might also think of as the word for the fin of a whale. Um, and it, it's derived as, again because that part of the whale is flat. So these are all worm, these are all words that mean flat, smooth. Uh, these flukes are flat and pretty smooth. And when you see them, um, you guys ever pressed pennies like at the zoo or you know, souvenir places where you press pennies? And they wind up flat and wide and oval shaped. Yeah, that's the same thing that these flukes look like. Um, they look like pressed pennies. They're flat and wide, oval shaped. And they sometimes have a head that, um, that pooches out a little bit of the front of the body, but sometimes they're just a nice smooth oval. And they live inside the organs of bigger animals. They have a very thick body wall. We would call the body wall a tegument. Um, and so that's to keep them from being digested or being attacked by the host's body. Because obviously, if, if it's living inside an organism, a larger animal, that animal's body is going to try to get rid of it. So it's going to bombard it with antibodies, and it's going to bombard it with all kinds of um, proteins to try to break it down and kill it. But God has designed these worms to live inside and their house is your body, and they have a very thick, waxy kind of body wall that um, host animals can't really get through to kill the worm. So they live inside the organs. Mostly they live in livers. Livers is where you find flukes more than anywhere else. Uh, and so uh, 
if you are a hunter or your dad is a hunter, or I suppose if your mom is a hunter, and they go out and kill some wild creature and bring it home for you to eat. Um, most of the time, uh, if you were to carefully look through the liver, most wild animals have blues in the liver. It's a very, very common parasite, uh, which is why if you eat liver, um, you need to make sure that it's cooked thoroughly because you, you want to kill the worms and all of their little eggs that are in the liver. You, liver is not something that you eat medium rare. Um, so there you go. That's that's going to be something you can think of next time you have a medium rare burger. Um, but uh, the burgers not have liver. It's okay. Um, they have other parasites that you can get. But not um, so they live inside the organs of larger animals. They feed on their tissues and their blood. So they will take a bite of the liver and uh, eat the tissue, and then as it starts to bleed they will drink the blood. And then as long as that is bleeding, they will feed on the blood. And then when they need another meal, they'll take another bite and then feed on the blood. Um, as, as long as that, that wound is bleeding. Um, they reproduce sexually, and they shed their eggs through host feces into the environment. So they live in your liver mostly, not hopefully not yours, they live in the liver of larger animals mostly. And the liver, um, is in the is attached to you know the bloodstream flows through there very very much as and then there is this tube the the bile duct that goes through there into the um, into the stomach into the intestine and they will shed their eggs through that into the intestine so now if you know if there's a sheep or a, or a goat or a deer or something that has liver blues now the eggs of the fluke get passed out through the feces of the host and into the environment. Um, flukes generally have to have two different hosts in their life cycle. The main adult host, like the lamb or the sheep or the pig or the deer, and then an intermediary host, because most of the time an animal does not eat its own poop. <laughs> most of the time, although there are some animals that do. And uh, like dogs that will occasionally eat their own poop, cats will sometimes do that too. Um, but most of the ruminants don't eat their own poop, deer, sheep, things like that. Uh, and so there's usually an intermediary host. The egg gets uh, eaten by some little creature that's eating poop, like a, like a worm or like a, uh, a snail or something like that. And then the egg hatches, and it's a very small larva in the body of that intermediary host. And then along comes a sheep or a pig or a deer eating grass, and it takes a bite of grass and gets a little, gets a snail with it, and it doesn't care. It just chews up the snail and swallows. And now the intermediary host is inside the, the target animal. And the eggs will, or the larva will come out of the body of the intermediate host and get into the body of the main host again. So there's usually a, an intermediary host that hosts the parasite's larva. Um, mature flukes leave the intestine, the intermediate host, and attach to plants, waiting to be eaten by the target host, and then, you know, in, in it goes. Or if the intermediary host itself gets eaten, all the better. Okay? So this is what a fluke looks like, okay? Um, like I said, they look kind of like pressed pennies. Some of them have a bump where the head is, sometimes the head is just part of the curvature of the, um, of the body of the animal. Some really cool things about these flatworms is they have a head, but the mouth is not where the head is. So um, the head is up here, but the mouth is actually right about here. Um, and the, uh, the mouth on this guy where are you, mouth? The mouth is right here, um, but the head is up here. So the mouth is is kind of where our like know, shoulders would sit, and the uh, it eats on the bottom of the animal. Uh, and then they they have this branching digestive system, so the food spreads out through these these branching tubes to go to all the different cells of the body. Um, and then their um, waste is gathered 
by these other branching uh, organs, the nephridia, that go through and gather up waste products. So they look they look sort of I don't know like a smashed collage when you look at them in a microscope, but they're they're pretty cool. Some of them look um, not as appetizing when you find them in your meat. So this is a deer liver, and um, the uh, the guy cleaning the deer uh, found this and took a picture of it. So yeah, this is deer liver, and these are worms. Here they are, living all over the deer's liver. So this is not a deer whose liver you're going to eat. Um, and uh, the rest of the meat might be fine, but the, the liver is where you typically find these guys. Um, this is another one. This is beef liver and flatworms all from the beef liver. Okay. And again, the life cycle uh, lives in the liver of the cow. The cow poops out the eggs. The eggs are eaten by a, by a uh, snail and will develop for a while inside the snail. If the snail is eaten with the grass, good for the, good for the uh, worm. Otherwise, when it's done with its larval cycle, it will crawl out of the snail and wait on the top of a blade of grass for a cow or a sheep or a pig or something to take a bite of grass and also eat the larva. And then it'll find its way into the liver and complete the life cycle. Okay. Yummy stuff. Tapeworms. These are even more fun. Tapeworms. These are also platy helmets, right? Also flatworms. Tapeworms attach to the intestinal wall of a host and absorb nutrients from the host's intense intestine. These guys look like, I don't know, they look like something from a horror movie when you see them. Um, they have a head that's called a scolex. And the scolex has a bunch of hooks and suction cups. Ooh, I'm missing a space. Suction cups to oh, anchor the animal to the intestinal wall. So um, it doesn't want to leave when it is inside you. It suction cups to your intestinal wall, and then it drives hooks into the tissue of your intestine. So it's well anchored. The scolex is very hard to get rid of. Once it's there, it's there. It's all tied up in your tissues. Um, and then it doesn't have a mouth. It doesn't have most of the organs that you would think an, an animal needs to have. It lives bathed in digestive juices and digestive food. And so it is swimming in a nutrient broth all the time. All the stuff that your body would like to feed you with, it's swimming in. So it doesn't need a stomach. It's in your stomach. It doesn't need a mouth, you've chewed up the food. It doesn't need digestive juices, you've made them up. All it has to do is absorb through its skin all of the yummy things that the body of the host meant to go into its body. So consequently, once they get there, they grow real fast because they have to do no work at all. They're swimming in good stuff, right? So um, they just absorb their nutrients, and they are reproductive monsters. They create these little packets, segments of their body called the proglottid. And every proglottid, it starts up by the head, starts up by the scolex. Every proglottid has um, both gametes. It has sperm and egg. It has testis and ovary in every body segment. And so every body segment fertilizes itself and becomes full of eggs and swells and grows and gets bigger. And then eventually at the end of the worm, these proglottids break off. And so they become packets of eggs that break off the end of the worm. And of course they're in your intestine, so you poop them out. And then in environments where uh, there's not good hygiene, where people wipe themselves and don't wash their hands um, and then go eat something. Now there's there's more, you know, there's tapeworm eggs on your hands. And you take a bite of food and you've just added more tapeworms to your gut. Or um, in some cultures where they use human 
fecal matter as a fertilizer, which happens in lots of third world countries. Um, somebody, you know, tops a squat and mixes it through their soil and plants their beans there. And then as they're walking through their garden, harvesting their food, tapeworm eggs get on the food. And then you go take it to market and somebody buys your beans and you have tapeworm eggs all over your vegetables and your produce and those people now get tapeworms. Um, obviously it happens really easily in, in uh, livestock farms where a cow is pooping in the same pasture that it's grazing in. Right, because that's totally an easy cycle. It poops on the grass, then it eats the grass. Um, and so tapeworm is really common in factory farms, factory livestock farms. Um, and they wind up having to, you know, give the medications to, to kill the tapeworm all the time um, because tapeworm can spread really quickly through those sorts of environments. Um, so these proglottids, when you see them, they are just they're purely reproductive structures that swell up and get full of eggs and break off the end of the worm. So here's what they look like. This is, this is the head, this is the scolex. Uh, and everything that the tapeworm is of itself is the head. All the rest of the worm, every segment here, and there's small segments near the front, then in this mid part of the worm, you can see that they start to flatten out and swell and get bigger. And then this is a near the end of the worm. They're huge. They start off real small and then they get bigger towards the end of the, of the worm. And all they're doing is making eggs and swelling with full and mature eggs. This whole thing is a reproductive structure. The whole body of the worm is a reproductive structure. Um, the, the worm itself is only right here, right? And it's, it's attached to your intestinal wall or the intestinal wall of a cow or a dog or whatever. These are everywhere. Um, and they just absorb the food. It's really awesome. This is a close-up of the head of a scolex. Okay? Yeah. So tons of suction cups and tons of hooks. And so once it's, once it's in, man, it's in. Um, and then the end of the tapeworm these are just proglottids that are breaking off and would be passing out with the feces. Okay. Here's a lovely thought. If a if you eat tapeworm eggs and it's the wrong species of tapeworm, that the tapeworm doesn't recognize your intestinal chemistry as where it's supposed to be. So this is called an ectopic parasite where the parasite it's like let's say it's dog tapeworm but dog tapeworm eggs get eaten by a cow the tapeworm hatches out of the eggs and says this is not where i'm supposed to be i'm going to go looking for where i'm supposed to be so it starts to burrow it burrows out of your intestinal wall and it floats around in your blood until it gets stuck it finds you know it gets to the end of the capillary and it can't squeeze through capillary and continue to float through your blood. So in some part of you, there's a tapeworm that it's not supposed to be there, but it's like, well, I guess this is where I am. Okay, so it sets up house. Now they don't tend to get very big because they're, it's not swimming a nutrient bath like it's supposed to. So it just becomes a small little worm. But, and your body tends to react by forming a cyst around it or something like that. Um, but you can slice into meat, and this is this is uh, this is fish. This is tuna, and uh, a tuna somehow ate tapeworm eggs, and the tapeworm was like, "I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be in a tuna." So it same thing burrowed out of the intestine, got in the bloodstream, landed in the meat, and then as you're slicing the meat, you find these things in the meat. And you're like, "What's that? It's tapeworm." Somehow that got in there, um, and it's not supposed to be there. But if you eat sushi, if you ate this, now I eat sushi too, but you have to eat sushi from reputable places that have very high quality meat and pay attention to the quality of the meat as they're making the sushi. Because if you eat, if you eat cheap sushi, 
mass produced where people are not paying attention. And you eat these, now the tapeworm's like, oh, I'd much rather be in a mammal than a fish, because I'm supposed to really be in mammals. And then the tapeworm's like, yay, freedom. And it goes and sets up its, itself in you, because that's where it really wanted to be. And you've just you know, got lots of tapeworm. You can um, have tapeworm in bad places like this, this person's mouth. This is not the uvula that hangs down. This is a tapeworm that got in their body and set up house and in, wound up swelling and invading the mouth. So there's a tapeworm in that There's a tapeworm in that sack. Oh, uh, isn't that awesome? Um, you can have tapeworms oh, in eyeballs. Oh. Oh. That's a tapeworm in somebody's eye. Get up there? Because it, it's beef tapeworm, so it didn't recognize your intestine. So it burrowed through your intestine wall and wound up. That's the capillary it got stuck in. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm in an eyeball now. Yeah, that's a good time. Um, oh, I don't have the picture of the guy at the CAT scan. I've got to find it for you. There's a guy who, who frequently ate cheap sushi, uh, like at some bad sushi restaurant, and he ate it a lot. And he started he started dying, and the, the doctors went, what's wrong with you? And they did a CAT scan, and he was just riddled with tapeworm cysts all through his body. Um, and, and yeah, there's nothing you can do at that point. So. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know the. I just have the picture and the little story about how that happened. Um, free living flatworms do exist, and they are called planaria. Um, they have a pointed head with a pair of eye spots. They look like they've got kind of an arrow pointed head. Um, the eyes can't focus. They just detect light. So it just knows I'm exposed or I'm not. And it helps the worm hide. It helps the worm burrow down or go under a rock or go behind a plant. It doesn't want to be where there is sunlight because then birds will see it or then it will, you know, dry out and things like that. So um, it has a blind digestive tract as well with a mouth, anus in the center of the ventral surface, just like the other ones do. The mouth is near the belly. Um, and the pharynx too, these guys are interesting. They don't. They don't take bite. Uh, they don't have jaws. They uh, they have a sucking tube called a pharynx, and a sucking tube comes out their mouth and sucks up what they want to eat. Which is kind of strange. The, it, to picture a tube coming out your belly button and sucking up what you want to eat, kind of a strange thing. Um, and they are hermaphroditic. They uh, have both both uh, gonads. And, but they don't fertilize themselves, they fertilize each other. It's just that both of them wind up getting pregnant after a sexual encounter instead of one getting pregnant after a sexual encounter. Um, and they can regenerate lost parts. If you cut a planarian in half, you wind up with two planaria after a while. And there, I'll show you some pictures of people that have done experiments where they, they half cut a planaria in half. So they cut it halfway down and then let it regenerate and wind up with two heads. Kind of weird stuff. Um, they excrete through flame cells. Um, so these are, yeah, it sounds like they burn, but they don't. Uh, they have a whole bunch of cells around their body that just locally gather up toxins and squirt them out. So they don't have like a kidney and a urinary system. But all throughout their body, they're just excreting the toxins out of their, their body. Uh, I'm going to pause for a moment because I think they're still writing. So, this is what they look like. Their head kind of is arrow shaped. This one looks like it's got ears too. Um, but a pointy head and a flat body. Uh, there's another one. And its mouth is right here in its belly. And this is the pharynx. And they will stick this tube about its belly and suck up what it wants to eat. And then the branching digestive system that goes throughout it, similar to a flu. These are pictures of people who have cut a planarium and then let it regenerate. So this one got cut on the tail and the head, and now it has two heads and two tails. This one had its head cut in half, and now it has two heads. Same thing here and same thing here. So planaria will regenerate, and if these were done in a lab for the purpose of taking a picture after it's regenerated, but it happens in nature all the time, where it gets partly cut and it winds up with two of something. So you'll see two-headed worms out there, 
or two two tailed worms or things like that. It's kind of odd. Um, this is a planaria eating, and so uh, its head is up here, and it has stuck its tube out its belly button, and it's right on the top shelf. See it? Can you reach it? There you go. Um, there you go. Sorry, I would have gotten it down. I thought it was wrong. There you go. So this uh, this tube is its pharynx. Its head is over here, but it's eating over here. Kind of an interesting thing. See? And then nematodes. Now we are in a different phylum. And I am definitely going to need to finish this some tomorrow. That's okay. Um, phylum nematoda. These are unsegmented roundworms, so we're not in flatworms anymore. Most of them are very, very, very small. There are some that are big, but most of the time when you see a, a nematode, it's only a centimeter or two long. Uh, they live in all environments of the world, though. We have found them in all kinds of strange places where it's very hard to live. But nematodes are really robust and able to handle most environments. Um, they have a complete digestive system. They have a mouth and an anus that are not the same thing. And so um, they're the first creature we've talked about with a mouth and a butt that are different. Um, so yay for a different whole. Um, the nematode's the first ones with one of those. They don't have a very coordinated musculature system. So they move with uncoordinated thrashing. <laughs> if it's not where it wants to be, it basically has a seizure until it is somewhere else, okay? Um, and so they, uh, yeah, they can't like inchworm themselves along because they don't have any segments. So when one part of them squeezes, the whole worm like gets stiffer, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. So they just flip around until they are somewhere that they want to be, which is really frustrating if you're trying to commute as a nematode. But um, anyway, most of them are parasitic, so most of them, again, it doesn't really matter too much because they go wherever you go. Um, they do have sexual reproduction and they have separate sexes. So the flatworms are mostly hermaphrodites. Um, the nematodes are separate sexes, so they need to, you know, run into Mrs. Nematode to have baby nematode. But um, they, again, they're they're parasites, so they're living inside some other creature, and Mrs. Nematode is right there. Um, common human examples are, is the Ascaris. Now, this guy is kind of gross, and I think I will leave our lecture here with this wonderful story. Um, the Ascaris worm lives in your lungs. Lung worm. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, no, that's not true. I'm sorry, that's not true. It comes through your lungs. Hold on. Let me get it straight in my head. There you go. Not true that it lives in your lungs. Anyway, uh, it lives in your gut. There you go. Lives in your gut. You poop out the eggs. So, uh, through bad hygiene, you eat the eggs. But the eggs, uh, the eggs hatch out into little larvae in your upper GI and go through your body wall and wind up in your blood. Little tiny worms in your blood, and they they uh, pop out of your blood capillaries in your lungs, and they spend a period of development in your lungs where they're growing and they're they're becoming slightly bigger. And then when they're ready to be mature and live long-term in your intestine, the easiest way for a somewhat large worm to leave your lungs and wind up in your gut is for you to cough them up and then swallow them, right? Because you're like, ah, ah, ah. you swallow, right? But if you were awake when you did that, then you'd cough it up and you'd be like, what's that thing? And you'd spit it out and be like, worm, weird. That's strange, and you can go to the doctor, right? Um, so they know when you're asleep, and they and they start to come up your bronchioles while you're asleep, and you cough in your sleep and swallow, and you don't notice the, the little chunk. 
that you just swallowed, and then now it goes down into your gut and he sets up his house. Uh, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, so this is this is what an Ascaris diagram looks like. This is a cross-section of Ascaris. You're going to see cross-section of Ascaris tomorrow in the microscope lab. This is a mature Ascaris worm. Most of them are pretty small. Some of them get, get good size. Okay. Oh, and that's actually the end of the lecture. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not. Okay. That's another Ascaris worm. Here's one that, um, this is a different species, but this is a round worm that parasized somebody's eyeball. Well, no, they, they saw the worm and they made a small cut and are pulling it out. They clap up the eye. Does that hurt when you pull it? I'm sure they do. Sure it does. This is elephantitis. Elephantitis. Oh <laughs> elephantitis is a disease caused by a worm. And the worm clogs the um, the lymphatic system that drains excess fluids from parts of you. So right now in your feet and legs, there's fluid leaving your cells all the time. But you have a fluid return system called the lymphatic system that gathers up that return, that leaked fluid and puts it back in your blood. Um, the worms clog that, and so the leaked fluid builds up, and the skin swells, and the muscles swell, and everything swells because the fluid is just not leaving. And so you wind up with huge feet and legs. Uh, it's called elephantitis, but it's caused by a worm that's clogging up this guy's pipes. And we'll get to analytics tomorrow. All right. We are going to finish this up. I didn't quite get a chance to finish it when we were doing it the first time. So, phylum Analyta is the last phylum that we need to address. These are the segmented roundworms. These are the ones that you just got to play with and dissect up. Uh, they're the most complicated body structure of any of the worm phyla, um, and they have they have uh, segments uh, which are divided across by muscle walls called septa. And the, the septa you saw when you were dissecting them, the, they're the, the rings that go through the whole body. And so these little septa allow them to squeeze themselves. And when they squeeze themselves, you know, uh, circumference, around the circumference, then they get longer. And so that's principally how they move, is they squeeze their body to drive themselves into a longer shape, and then they anchor these little hairs um, called setae into the soil, and then they relax their muscles, which, which makes them shrink into a, a shorter shape. And then they squeeze and get longer and anchor their hairs again and then let their body catch up to them. So uh, that's how they move along. And they have a complete digestive tract. So the nematodes also had a complete digestive tract. Uh, the, the earthworms do as well, so they're, they, they don't have the mouth anus that you've seen in several animal groups up to this point. Um, and they have a complete, they have a closed uh, circulatory system, which is actually on the next slide. I see some of you writing, so I'm going to pause. Okay, so they, uh, they have this barrel-shaped swollen region that uh, you all saw in the dissections called the clitellum. And that is, um, that makes what's called an egg case. So they are all hermaphrodites, and um, they, they mate with another worm, so they don't fertilize themselves. But when they have mated with another worm, they, are, they both wind up having to get fertilized in the, in the process. Um, and they, the clitellum secretes this, I don't know, waxy sort of, material that they lay their eggs in and then they crawl out of it and you get what's called a, a casting and that's a uh, it's a wax looking case that holds the eggs and the, the earthworm eggs will develop in that so the clitellum is used to, to secrete this thing that makes that, that holds the eggs and keeps them safe while the eggs are developing um, using reproduction First group with a closed circulatory system. Everything else we've seen um, does not have veins and a heart, like you saw that the worm, the earthworm does. The earthworm has not just one heart, but several hearts, right? And uh, and so these several hearts close are, are closed, 
and squeeze and circulate the blood around the worm. Uh, and this is the first group that we've looked at that has that. Nematodes don't have that. Flatworms don't have that. Uh, and none of the other animals, the sponges and the nightmares, have that. So uh, this is the first group we've talked about that has that closed circulatory system with veins going throughout the body and a heart. As we've already said, they're hermaphroditic and they can regenerate. So if you were to cut an earthworm in half, um, both halves will grow the part that you cut off. And so you would wind up having two earthworms after a while. But it does take time. It's not like you're going to snip a worm in half and then come back tomorrow. Um, it takes quite a while for it to happen, but it does eventually happen. So um, oftentimes, especially if you're looking for worms, if you're digging up worms, you'll, you'll cut one in half and you shovel. And be like, oh, bugger, only half a worm. But it's okay. That worm will it'll be fine. Um, I'm sure it wasn't fun to get cut in half. But uh, eventually, the worm will be okay. Um, it will grow into a whole other worm, and the other part that you cut off will grow into a whole other worm, so that's good. They respire through their skin, so they don't have lungs, they don't have gills, there was nothing like that that you found in the dissection. All of the gas exchange just happens through their moist skin, which is why it needs to stay moist, and if they dry out, they die, um, because it's the moist skin that allows the gases to exchange. So the oxygen coming in and the CO2 coming out just happens through their skin. Amphibians do that too, um, where they will respire through their skin, but they also have lungs in addition to it. But the earthworm or, or annelids in general just respire through the skin. Okay. Um, they also have very simple kidneys called nephridia, and these filter bl uh, blood and excess wastes out through the skin. So they don't pee. They um, their waste products go out through their skin again. So, um, yeah, yeah, you found that out after you were handling it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but they, they filter their blood and the waste products just go out through their skin. So, uh, they poop though, as you saw. Lots of them, lots of them were pooping as you were playing with them. Um, and they're kind of always eating and always pooping. They, as they're crawling through dirt, they, they eat their way through the dirt and they fill their hole that they just made with their body with their poop as they go. So they're kind of, they're always filtering the dirt, um, which is which is good. That's why you want them in a garden, because they aerate the soil, and they turn the soil, and they enrich the soil. They crawl through and eat stuff and, and poop all the time. So it makes, makes soil better. Earthworms are our friends when it comes to gardening. Um, it's just some pictures here. This diagram is hard to see on my broken sad projector, um, but this is the uh, the musculature showing all of these uh, transverse muscles and then longitudinal muscles. Um, on the earthworm, there were two layers of muscle there, the muscles that squeeze them this way and the muscles that switch them this way. Uh, and so they use those opposing pairs of muscles to travel around. And then they also have several uh, hearts here up in the front, um, and one long ventral uh, nerve. Uh, uh, sorry, it was, it, was it was a dorsal artery, right? Yes, it was a dorsal artery uh, that goes along their their whole body. So you saw that live and in person. Yours looks more like this. Um, so and then the the clitellum, the the thing that secretes the egg case, um, and then they had several organs involved in eating. We have a, an esophagus and a stomach. They have a pharynx, which sucks uh, the dirt into their mouth. Oh, it, sucks. it sucks the dirt into their mouth. And then a crop and a gizzard and then a stomach. And those are the, the different muscular organs that like grind up the dirt and whatever edible substances they happen to have found and then the intestine that goes throughout their body, okay? Uh, earthworms look like this, you just played some. This one's a little fatter than the ones you guys had. Um, and then some annelids, their setae become rather large and pronounced. And so this is an annelid and their setae get to be kind of big. And at first you might think it looks like a millipede, but it's a worm and these are just their setae that are big and look sort of like legs. Um, and some of the worms have 
very, very pronounced setae where it totally looks like legs. But that's a, that's not a centipede, that's a worm. He just has big setae. Um, these are called polychaete worms. Um, and then in the ocean, uh, there are annelid worms, and I've already we've already shown some pictures of these that have really beautiful gills that they stick out of their mouth and filter feed using their gills, and then they eat um, off of the uh, the stuff that gets stuck to them. So it looks kind of like a butterfly, but this is the mouth of a worm, and the body of the worm is down buried in the coral, and this is just the uh, the gills coming out of its mouth. Some of them are really beautiful. Um, some of them are called Christmas tree worms because they their gills look sort of like Christmas trees. Uh, if you do, they pull them in immediately. So, and then of course leeches are the one parasitic group of animals. Um, so there you go.